In this last lecture, in this module, we're going to talk about active investment in private capital. This is a process there where individuals or private capital organizations, um, uh, limited partnerships or general partners, uh, take control of a company or take over uh, elements of a company, the assets of a company, for the purposes of trying to create shareholder value for their investors, themselves and their investors. So let's talk about uh, active investment, private investment, and then some, um, some current trends. An acquisition, as we talked about before in the context of mergers a little bit, is when one company purchases another generally by buying most or all of its stock. The acquired company may become a subsidiary of the buyer or its operations and assets may be merged with those of the buyer. When a company or an individual, sometimes called a corporate raider, wants to acquire or take over another company, it first offers to buy some or all of the other company's stocks, generally at a premium price over the current price of the company. Uh, share price. That's called a tender offer, essentially offering the shareholders to tender their shares in return for this price, this uh, purchase price. The head To head off a hostile takeover attempt, a company's managers will sometimes use a poison pill to try and stop the, the uh, outsider from coming in. This allows stockholders to buy more shares at the stock price lower than the current market price and then this will will keep the raider out because the cost of the business becomes uh, more um, the, there's alternatives in terms of getting the access to the capital than buying from the external and vendor it becomes too expensive to purchase for the corporate raider An another technique that's used is what's called a shark repellent this is just these are just colorful terms because this is a very competitive and predatory environment so we use a, a, another a colorful term a shark repellent that's when management requires a large majority of stockholders to approve a takeover in other words it can't just be 51 percent or 50 plus percent it needs to be some larger amount and that can be done within the corporate uh, bylaws um, sometimes they'd also do what they call seeking a white knight, which is mean find somebody to purchase the shares instead of the uh, acquisition company, the company that's seeking to acquire, or get someone else to buy the company at the same price or a close price, someone who they feel that they are more comfortable with bringing on board. That person then takes control of the company and then goes through a, a series of steps which generally leaves the management team in place, which is why they would buy a white, you know, they would seek a white knight better more than some outside private equity or corporate raider who is likely to replace management. Oftentimes these types of acquisitions when private capital is involved, they also involve debt. A leveraged buyout is a, in a, a process where a private equity firm or corporate raider purchases a company, but much of the purchase price is, by, is, is gained or gathered, collected by raising or by taking on debt. And that debt then is paid down by the profits of the company going forward. Instead of there being profits that are paid to shareholders, the profits go to paying down the debt so that the new owners then own the company. This is when a leveraged buyout is when the group of investors borrows the money that they need to get the full purchase price to buy all of the shares or they use part or some other assets to purchase the company in, in way uh, to repay the loan. They might sell some of the assets or sell some of the business units to help repay the loan. It's called a leveraged buyout or LBO. It started in the 1980s and 1990s when LBO mergers and acquisitions were things that dominated the consolidation in the marketplace and a good deal of shareholder value was created. These sound like perhaps negative things, but it does turn out that sometimes management becomes entrenched and doesn't necessarily serve the shareholders, but serve their own interests. 
and a leverage buyout is a tool where the marketplace takes advantage of the transactions of buying the shares to make sure management is stays focused on ma maximizing shareholder value. If a company has maximum shareholder value, then the leveraged buyout firms can't cannot compete with the marketplace itself in terms of its equity valuations. Um, some people use see mergers and acquisitions as a positive force in this way because it boosts share prices and market value, keeps organizations focused on their objective of maximizing shareholder value. Critics, however, argue that mergers can hurt companies because they force managers to focus most of their or many of their efforts, particularly during the acquisition process itself, on avoiding these takeovers, maybe putting these poison pills or shark repellent type of processes in place. Um, plus, the companies sometimes in these, these actions take on heavy debt, and this can cause them to focus much too much on um, limiting or uh, reducing their expenses, and sometimes that hurts innovation and long-term growth prospects. Uh, just like anything else, these kinds of situations can be go too far and in some cases be disastrous where the companies could have survived perhaps under different circumstances, but the leverage buyout and the acquiring organization did not necessarily take the right moves and the company ends up losing much of its value. So there's downturns associated with all of these. So this is the last part we'll talk about in terms of these ways of ownership mechanisms of ownership of companies. Remember, we talked about sole proprietorships, partnerships, corporations, um, other types of ownership, such as LLCs and cooperatives. And then we talked about private companies, corporations, but also public corporations, and then some of the activities that, they, that occur. Remember that a corporation and an LLC or a, a company of that sort, a legal entity, keeps its liability internal to that so the owners are not liable for the liabilities of the company but at the same time there's a double taxation associated with them except for certain structures like a subchapter s which is a certain type of election that allows taxes to be only paid one time and that's when they're delivered when the profits are delivered to the owners so we have some discussion questions which we'll follow up with uh, and uh, that are that should be discussed on on Moodle. The discussion questions that I'm asking you to complete to add discussion on in Moodle um, are as follows. I want you to name some advantages. Choose to name five advantages of a sole proprietorship, for example, and also di differentiate among the different types of corporations there are: public, private, those sorts of things and supply some examples of each type or one example of each type. Um, would you rather own preferred stock or common stock and why? That's, uh, so you have to know what they each are and then comment on which would be preferred. Uh -huh. which, one, which one would you, rather, would you rather own? And then which form of business requires the most specialization of skills? which requires the least specialization, specialization of skills? Just give me some thoughts on um, on how these different parts, different ways of organizing might put all the burden on one person or alternatively allow you to have many different skill sets operating within a, uh, a, an organization if it uh, becomes larger or whatever. So these are the five, uh, the four questions. If you would answer those on Moodle and then respond to one of your classmates' comments as well. And we'll see you on the next module module, let's be module five.